Hi again. So we're in our series on the book of the Philippians. We're taking a couple of weeks to just go through the book, and we're, we're taking sort of a more, not sort of, but we're taking a more exegetical approach. We're asking the Bible, what do you have to say? And letting the Bible tell us the things that it wants to focus on as opposed to bringing our problems to the, to the Bible and asking those questions, which is also a legitimate way to work with the Bible. But we want to make sure that we also let the Bible speak for itself sometimes. So today we're in Philippians chapter 2. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it starts on page number 900. I would also encourage you to pull out your, if you have a phone with you or if you have your own Bible. Uh, I love reading the Bible off my phone because I can check a bunch of different translations. My, my preferred translation to preach out of is the NIV. I have my funky orange one here that I received as a gift when I visited another church and I just can't get over it. So I, I like to read out of the NIV. So if you have a phone, I encourage you to grab that one just because it'll make it a little easier to follow along. Last week, we had a terrific sermon from John and he shared with us from Philippians chapter one, he talked about Paul's story, how Paul came to faith, how Paul came to be in how he started the Philippian church and how he came to be in prison, which is where he wrote the letter to the Philippians. We almost called this series Happy Bars because Philippians is known as the happiest book of the Bible, but it was written from within prison. In fact, we had it called Happy Bars for a little while and then we concluded that that wasn't a very good title because nobody was getting it. So I'm glad that we got our new ones side by side for the gospel. But chapter two starts with this particular word. It starts with a word called, that's therefore. And as a preacher, I'm very fond of likes to say, whenever you see the word therefore, you got to ask yourself, what's it there for? And it's a reference to what comes before. So before just diving into chapter two, I think it's worth reminding ourselves how chapter one ends. So I'm actually going to start reading from Philippians chapter one, verse 27. I'm just going to read us right through to the end of chapter two. Give us a, give us an overview of the whole chapter. Let us know exactly what it is that we're talking about. And then we'll dig into what it is that the Lord has for us. Before that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for a place where we can gather to learn and to hear from you. Thank you for a worship team who leads us in your praises. Thank you for the Lord's table and the gift that that is to us, for your presence, for your spirit. We pray that our hearts would be open to you, Father, that we would be good soil, that the worries of this world would be left behind, and that your word would grow in our hearts. Amen. So starting from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a matter, manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 
Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, but I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. The word of the Lord. What does it mean to be human? Kind of an interesting question. It's not just a number of chromosomes, right? It's not, it's, not something, it's not just something biological that says I'm a human and not a dog. It's not a question of only brain capacity or, or the emotional range that we might have, right? The, the idea, the experience of being human is something more than just those, those biological, physical factors, and, and we would point to that. Unfortunately, most of how our culture would characterize what does it mean to be human is deeply negative. We talk about the human experience of flaws, of, of painful experience, of suffering, of failure. Sometimes we romance the idea and we say things like, pain lets you know that you're alive. And I mean, there's something true to that, right? But it's really negative. In uh, one of my favorite film series, Star Wars, in one of the uh, less popular installments, one of the characters expresses deep anguish and anger at a group of people and in fact is confessing the, the horrors that he's just inflicted on these people. And in a very, very strange moment, This character's love interest responds to him, to be angry is to be human. Is that what it means to be human? Anger? In another popular film franchise in The Matrix, the great enemy, Agent Smith, tells one of the characters that humans are a disease. Is this true? Is this what humanity is? Is this what it means to be human? Does it mean to be angry? Does it mean to be flawed? Does it mean to be a disease on the surface of the earth? Or is there something more? Are we better than that? Was this the plan? The Bible tells us that we were created in God's image. We were created in his image and likeness. Male and female, he created them. What does that mean? I I think it means a lot of things. To me, if it means one thing, it means that God looks like us. God doesn't have a body. God isn't a physical creature. But we're going to be able to see when we get to heaven, right? We're not, we're not going to be some psychic thing. And I think that when we look upon God, I think if you look at the image and likeness, I think if there's one thing that those words mean, it's that. But there's so many other things that it can and has been interpreted to mean. It can mean that we're creative, just like God who creates things. It means that we make things. It can mean that we're relational. God is relational and he lives in love and we're made to be living in love. There are so many things that being made in the image of God could and does mean. Ultimately, God sent his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who came to show us what the Father is like. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus tells his disciples that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus came to show us what God is like, but in truth of fact, Jesus came to show us what humans are really like. And this is a really weird thing, because we talk about what does it mean to be human, and let, let me try to put it another way. What is normal? Is normal the things that are, or is normal the things that should be? It, you know, it's a legitimate question. You can, you can interpret it either way. You don't, it's rhetorical in this instance. But humans are defined by flaws. Humans are defined by sin. Humans are defined by anger and disease and all of these awful things and these things that we experience. That truly is a defining part of the human experience. But is that what it really means to be human? Or does being human really mean to reflect the Father in all of the ways that Jesus did? Are you truly most human when you are most like God? Because that's who God created us to be. God has created us to be loving and kind and generous. And when we don't live up to those things, we say, well, I'm only human. But in truth, when we are those things is when we're the most human. So Paul's plea in Philippians 2 to the church in Philippi is, be like Jesus. Just be like him. That's it. That's what it means to really be human. That's who you are made to be. And Paul lays that out. And I think we can, we can pull, you know, in classic preacher style, three things that Paul means from that. And I, I've divided the, the chapter up a little bit to help us see that. The first one that I'd like to point to is in verses 1 and 2, where Paul tells us to be like Jesus by focusing on the mission. I'll read it again. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any com- common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. What is the one spirit and the one mind that Paul is, is encouraging us to have? Paul isn't encouraging us to all get behind the same type of music. He's not getting, asking us to please be unified in, in your preference for how you like to take communion. That's, that's not what Paul's after. He wants us to be unified. But the unity that Paul um, requests of us, demands of us even, is the unity of Jesus where Jesus was focused on his mission. That Jesus had many occasions to be distracted and distracted by good things. There are several examples in the Gospels where Jesus is in a town and he's doing good works and people are believing in him and receiving miracles and healings and and coming to a knowledge of the Father. And instead of staying there, Jesus says, I have to go on to the next town. Because Jesus has the mission in mind, and he's focused on that more so than he's focused on trying to build his following in one particular town. And so we also need to be concerned about the big things. It means that our preferences come secondary to God's mission. It means that when we are united, we don't necessarily agree about things like, should we have pews or should we have chairs? It means that we are united in saying we want there to be good things for us to sit on as a congregation so that people can come and hear the love of God. And we can discuss what the best way to do that is, but but we are united in the goal. That when we talk about what worship styles we're going to be singing, that it's not a question of we need hymns. We need none of this old people music. Right? This doesn't go either way. That we are united in that we desire to worship the Father and to show the world what that looks like. That our preferences are secondary and that together we could share one spirit and one mind of being focused on the mission. The second thing that Paul commands of us is to be other-focused. To focus elsewhere in our relationships than ourselves. And he tells us this through in verses 3 through 8. 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And then he gives us an example. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's a lot of Christology we could unpack there. We could dive into the the theological nuance of what does it mean for Jesus to be of the same um, spirit as the Father, you know, homoousius, the the one essence. But, you know, that's not really going to help us today. What we should, what we can and should focus on is that Jesus had a station, a position in life, in eternity, far above what he did. Jesus took on a role that was so much below what he could have done. He could have sent an angel to share the good news with us. He could have done all sorts of things. He could have raised up yet another prophet. But instead, he sent himself. That the Lord came, he became a child, and he joined us. And he didn't think of himself as too good. Are there things that you think of yourself? I'm too good for that? Probably not. Those aren't words that we usually use. Sometimes we use words more like, well, that's not my calling. That's not my gifting. And those those are good things to be aware of. But we have to examine our own hearts and say, is it that it's not my calling to serve coffee or or on the soundboard or to usher? Or is it that I don't think that's important enough and I don't want to give my time to it? And you you have to answer that for yourselves. That could very well be that God isn't calling you to to volunteer in that area, and he doesn't have to. You don't have to be called to every single area. But that is something that you have to consider. How can we, in our lives, work to put others first? Is it a question of, after service today, not going straight for a nap when you get home? I'm really bad for that. Is it a question of making your bed before you leave the room so that your wife is happy when she comes back? What are the ways that you can find to put others ahead of yourself? That yes, you have things and you have things that you need to do, but how can you think about others first? Maybe it's as simple as just checking in before you go take care of some of those other things. Again, this is something that you're going to have to wrestle for yourself, but I think that we can all think of ways that we can put others first in our lives. <coughs> Excuse me. I promise I don't have the coronavirus. This is the Christmas plague hanging on. I've been coughing forever. Finally, the third thing that Paul leaves us with is he commands us to serve joyfully. So he's, he's commanded us to focus on the mission, to be other-focused, and the third one is to serve joyfully. And this comes out in verses 14 to 18 where Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad. And rejoice with me. I got to tell you, verse 14, that might be the most challenging verse in the whole Bible to me. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Good luck. Who's, who's dropped a complaint today? Come on, be honest. Who's complained about something today? I complained this morning about the weather because it's too warm and I need to wash my car. And the moment I walk out of that car wash, walk, drive out of the car wash, car will be dirty again. Complaining about warm weather. This is, this is very normal, but it's not ideal. This is the human experience to complain, but it's not what it means to be truly human. 
In fact, I would argue that this is possibly the spirit of our age, to complain and to argue. Some people have referred to one of the ways that our social media has affected us as outrage culture, that we're looking for something to be angry about constantly, that we flit from one thing to another and don't really try to resolve anything, but the more things that come up, the angrier we are. I once had to tell a friend who brought, brought me something that well and truly was horrible, and I had to sa- tell him, you know what, I, I don't care. I've got, I've got stuff going on in my world that I have to help. I don't have the energy to worry about something going on in, I don't remember if it was Uganda or Thailand or what, like it was, but it was, it was distant. And in our world, we have a tendency to be focused on things so far away that our outrage just moves and continues and flows and we can't be people of peace. Have you met people like that? People of peace? They really do shine like stars in the sky. If you have an employee or a coworker or somebody and they don't complain, you will notice and you will notice very quickly because they're nice to be around. And it's kind of weird, but in a really good way. We have to remember that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So Paul commands these three things of us, of how we can be like Jesus. He tells us to focus on the mission. He tells us to be other-focused and to serve joyfully. And then Paul puts it into practice. Paul spends the second half of this chapter almost wingmanning, talking up his two friends, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Did you notice that in the second part of this chapter, Paul basically doesn't say anything about himself? There's lots of I in there because he's speaking from a first person, but he's not talking about himself. He speaks very much and quite emphatically about the character and the worthiness of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Paul doesn't take the opportunity to boost himself up. He takes the opportunity to raise up those around him. In verse 20, he picks out Timothy and he tells them that I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. That's pretty high praise. In verse 29, he picks out Epaphroditus and he tells them to welcome him in the Lord with great joy and to honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. Here's the problem. Here's where maybe I can work in my Groundhog Day reference. We feel like we wake up every day and struggle through the same problems. We struggle with the same sins. We struggle with the same attitudes. And I think what Paul is getting at here is that these things that he's describing aren't so much behaviors. To complain, to do all things without complaining or disputing is not a question of stop complaining. It's a question of gratitude and positivity and it's not just a question of stop doing these particular things it's about reorienting some of those inner parts of our lives and that's a big call but what's amazing is that if we can do this if we can reset the cruise control on our lives actually that's a really good that's a really good analogy with cruise control i mean Likely many of us drive a car, so I may be preaching to the choir. But when you set the cruise control, you can accelerate faster. If you need to go, go past somebody, you can and you can press on it, and you can go faster. And then the, it'll just come back down to where you've set the cruise control. And sometimes our Christian lives are like that, where we say, oh, I really want to follow God. I'm going to work really hard, and I'm going to try really hard on this. And you do. You accelerate, and you're doing really great. And then over time... It just bleeds back off and we end up right back where we were. But if we can set that cruise control higher, then that's going to be our normal. And so Paul is sharing with us how to change our minds into God's minds, to have God's thoughts instead of our thoughts, that we can change the way that we think in some of the most fundamental ways so that we can be like Jesus even if we didn't read our Bible this morning. Wouldn't that be awesome? To still be Christ-like even if you've neglected some of those behaviors that you should be doing. 
I am not encouraging you to abandon reading your Bible. Quite the opposite. When we read our Bibles, when we meditate on God's word, when we let it get really deep down into us and dig into what God has to say for us, we can change the way that we fundamentally think about all of these things in our lives. We can shift who the first person is that we think of when there's a need to be met. Is it me or is it someone else? We can shift our attitudes of complaining versus gratitude. We can shift our attitudes about our preferences against God's preferences. And we can realign all of that. Because reading God's word is so important. A couple of years ago, I made, made, I, I went and found uh, a reading plan. And I, I approached a bunch of my friends and I said, let's read the Bible through over the next two years. Two years, right? Like, this is not a big ask. And one of the things that I discovered is that the number of chapters in the Bible is actually quite nicely divisible into the year. If you read one chapter a day, five days a week, you can read the whole, chap- the whole Bible in four years. Two chapters a day, you'll do it in two years. Four chapters a day? Amazing how fractions work. So I approached them and I said, if we can just read two chapters a day, and you can have the weekends off or to catch up, you know, you don't have to feel like a big ask, we can read the whole Bible through. And I had a number of friends say, wow, this is a really great idea, and then we'll be able to talk about it. It didn't really work out super well for us because we were all in really different seasons of life, but I had one friend who actually said to me, oh, I don't really read the Bible. That's not how I connect with God. And... I can appreciate that sitting down to read your Bible isn't always the most emotionally satisfying connection with God that you can find. I can appreciate that. For many people, going out into nature and being in awe of the Lord's creation is far more effective. For many people, gathering as a body and singing the praises of God is far more effective for creating an emotional, reactive presence of the Lord in your life. That's great. I love that. But if you don't read God's word, you can't realign your mind to his. You can't change that cruise control. That friend's faith was shipwrecked within three years. Like, shipwrecked. Bad. I shouldn't share too many details because people in my life will figure out who I'm talking about. But this is something that we can do. In fact, in chapter tw- or verse 12 and 13, we're reminded that it is our job, but he's, Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is on you. You need to do this. But it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So yes, this is something that we have to work towards, but it is something that God empowers us to do. It is something that God wills for our lives, wants for our lives, and will give you the strength and power to do. So we're not alone on it. This isn't a question of your willpower against your habits. And the truth is, we don't need to turn our lives around by tomorrow. Don't put yourself under that pressure. Just be a little better than last week. A little better than last week in focusing on the mission. A little better than last week in serving joyfully. A little better than last week in being other-focused. A little better than last week in being like Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would continue to work it with your spirit. Chip away at our hard edges, Lord. Remake us in the image of your son, that we could serve you to the best of our ability, Lord, in your power and your your grace. Pray that we would go from this place different for having met you. In your name we pray, amen.